Wishing you all a very, very happy Valentine's Day, my dear, dear friends. Hope you're having a good one. Well, I've got a collection of short stories all around the theme of love. But as you can probably guess, not exactly how people would want their Valentine's Day to go. Hmm. Hope you're sufficiently intrigued by that. <laughs> Well, everyone, hope you found someone to give you some love in this evening. If not, you can sit back and relax with me. Now it's a stormy, rainy night outside, but I'm in the warm, and I hope you'll join me. So, sit back and relax with your favorite drink, my dear friends, because it's time to listen. Are you almost done packing? My mother yelled up from the bottom of the stairs. Almost, I called back as I quickly stuffed a pair of flip-flops into my already bulging duffel bag. It was the summer just before my senior year of high school, and I was due to spend two weeks visiting my uncle in Northern California. Uncle Henry had moved to Santa Rosa shortly after his wife, my Aunt Clara, had passed away from ovarian cancer. We all thought the fresh start and change of scenery would help him get back on his feet, since he'd been struggling with depression after my aunt died. My uncle has since remarried, and now lives with a younger woman named Marie, and her eight-year-old daughter Clarissa, neither of whom I've ever met before. Danielle, it's time to go. Your father and I can't be late. I finished zipping up my bag and grabbed my purse before heading down the stairs to meet my parents who were anxiously waiting by the door. My parents were going on a cruise, which was departing out of a port in San Francisco, where I would then be taking the car to drive to my uncle's. After locking up the house and loading our bags into the car, we started on the coastal drive from our home in Oregon to San Francisco. So, how did Uncle Henry and Marie meet? I asked realizing that I didn't really know much about my uncle's new family. Uh, they met online on some sort of dating website for widowers, I think, Mom answered. Oh, okay. Well, how did Marie's first husband die? I glanced up from the back seat, genuinely curious. I don't have all the details. But as far as I know, he suffered a brain hemorrhage after fracturing his skull from a fall down the stairs, I think. But any more than that, you'd have to ask your uncle. That wasn't really the sort of conversation I wanted to bring up with Uncle Henry, seeing how it was a rather morbid topic. Jeez, that's too bad, I shrugged, and decided to drop the subject. The rest of the car ride was fairly silent. I slept for the last half of it while my parents listened to something on the radio. When we arrived at the San Francisco port, my parents got their bags out of the car and we said our goodbyes. I'd be back with the car to meet them when they got off of their cruise, but for now, I just needed to focus on the drive to my uncle's house, because I really wanted to show my parents that they made the right decision in trusting me with the car. This would be my first time driving such a distance on unfamiliar roads since I got my driver's license. I pulled up his address, which I'd saved on my phone navigator, and hopped in to the driver's seat. The drive was a lot shorter than I expected. Before I knew it, I was pulling into the driveway of my uncle Santa Rosa home. They must have heard me pull up because my uncle, a brunette woman and a little girl came out in the driveway to meet me. Danielle, greeted my uncle cheerfully as he embraced me in a tight hug. Let me introduce everyone. Danielle, this is Marie, and this here is Clarissa. Marie stepped forward and pulled me into a hug. It's so nice to meet you. Your uncle has told us so much about you. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you both, I say, smiling while stepping back and glancing down from Marie. To Clarissa. Oh, she's a bit shy, grinned Marie, as she squeezes her daughter's shoulder, who still hadn't said a word. Well, can I get your bags and show you inside? Offered Uncle Henry, who was still standing there with a smile from ear to ear. 
after getting the grand tour of the house and sitting to eat dinner. I went up to the guest room to settle in and get ready for bed. I really like Marie. She seems to make Uncle very happy, I thought to myself as I climbed into bed. But there's something off about Clarissa. I can't quite put my finger on it. It's just a feeling she gives me. And with that thought, I dozed off into a dreamless sleep. The first few days of my uncles were uneventful, to say the least. Perhaps even a little boring. It wasn't until I was asked to babysit that something rather bothersome occurred. My uncle and Marie had gone out for dinner, and I was left to babysit Clarissa and her friend Leslie. Leslie is a year younger than Clarissa, and lives a few houses down, so the girls frequently visited each other's houses for playdates. They were up in Clarissa's room playing with dolls when I went up to check. So I'd come down to use the computer in the living room to check some emails. I was halfway through reading a newsletter, when a sudden banging, followed by screaming, tore through my concentration. Startled, I jumped up and ran to the hallway to see what was going on. As soon as I ran to the corner of the hallway, I could see Leslie lying at the bottom of the stairs, crying her eyes out. I ran to her and, dropping to my knees, I asked, Leslie, what happened? Are you okay? Before she could reply, a voice drew my attention to the top of the stairs. It's time for Leslie to go home now, declared Clarissa, without showing any sign of emotion or sympathy for her friend. I turn my attention back to the sobbing child in front of me, and pick her up and carry her to the couch. Leslie, honey, did you fall down the stairs? I ask in my most soothing voice possible. She, she, she pushed me. Leslie managed to say through sobs. I'll deal with her later, okay? I'm going to call your parents to come and get you while you sit here and try to calm down. All right, honey? I stood up and headed towards the kitchen and proceeded to call Leslie's parents. Prior to going out, Marie had written Leslie's parents' phone number along with her own cell number down and left them on the fridge in case I needed to get a hold of them which I was super grateful for now. Leslie's mum had answered and said she'd be right over, so I went back to the living room to tell Leslie. I entered the living room to find Clarissa furiously whispering in Leslie's ear, who had a look of complete terror on her tear-stained face. Hey, what's going on? I asked while taking a seat besides Leslie. I was just telling Leslie that I hoped she didn't hurt herself when she fell down the stairs, smiled Clarissa. I looked down at Leslie, who solemnly nodded. Before I could ask her about being pushed, there was a knock at the door and Clarissa got up and ran to open it. Oh honey, Danielle said you'd had an accident on the stairs, are you okay? asked Leslie's mum who immediately headed straight towards her daughter. <laughs> I fell, sobbed Leslie, and she began to start crying again. Her mom picked her up and thanked me for calling her on their way out the door, to which I simply nodded and shut the door behind them. Clarissa, before I called her mom, Leslie said you'd pushed her. So what were you whispering to her when I walked in? to make her say she fell. Clarissa glared at me. Leslie is a liar. She fell, shouted Clarissa, before stomping up the stairs and slamming her door. It was already late by the time my uncle and Marie got home, so I decided not to mention all the details surrounding Leslie's visit until the following day. Hmm. Bad move on my part because the following morning my uncle told me that Clarissa had woken them up crying with stories of how horrible I had been and what a terrible babysitter and accused her of hurting her friend, even though Leslie had told me herself that she fell. 
shocked. I tried to respond and tell him what really happened. But he cut me off and told me he didn't appreciate me upsetting his family like that and how Clarissa would never do something so heinous. The days following this event were rather uncomfortable and I got nothing but the cold shoulder from Marie and evil glares from Clarissa. It was around this time that I'd noticed several of my belongings had gone missing, and I had a sneaking suspicion that Clarissa was to blame. I was too afraid to say anything, for fear of being told to stop accusing Clarissa again, so I would just have to wait for an opportunity to search her room in secret. That opportunity came on Sunday morning, while my uncle, Marie and Clarissa went to church. I said I wasn't feeling well, so I could stay home and get my things back out of Clarissa's room. I waited about 15 minutes after they had left and began my search. After going through her entire room, I'd found some quite disturbing things, but only two of these several items that I was missing. The most disturbing things I found were various family pictures which were hidden under her mattress. All the photos had the faces scratched, burned or torn out of them, except for the faces of Marie and Clarissa herself. Two of the photos were of the three of them at my uncle and Marie's wedding, but scribbled across my uncle's face were the words, Die! And burn in hell. Part of me wanted to take them and show my uncle, but I already knew he would never believe that Clarissa was capable of that. She can do no wrong in his eyes, and I would more than likely be accused of trying to make her look bad. So I left them alone and planned to email my uncle about their location after I was home. That way, if he didn't believe me, or got upset with me for whatever reason, at least I wouldn't be subjected to any more awkward family dinners. While I still had time before they arrived home from church, I decided to search my uncle and Marie's room also, which, to my shock, yielded the rest of my items. Had Marie been taking my things? And if she had, what was I supposed to do about it? I mean, I couldn't tell my uncle that I thought his new wife was a thief. Especially not after him believing Clarissa over me. I decided that I'd just have to keep most of my stuff locked away in the safety of my car. After all, I only had a few more days left. My last few days went by incredibly slowly and seemed to drag on. But finally the morning came to say goodbye. I could tell that Marie was thrilled to see me go, because she was in the best mood I'd seen her in since the day I arrived. Thanks for coming, she said, smiling in the fakest tone imaginable. Uncle Henry held his arms out for a hug. Nice having you here, kiddo. I gave him a hug and smiled. Yeah, thanks for having me, I said, as I turned to say goodbye to Clarissa. Marie and my uncle were already starting to head back to the front porch as I bent down to give Clarissa a quick hug. She wrapped her arms tightly around my neck and then whispered something that still gives me chills to this day. Mommy says I should have pushed you down the stairs when I had the chance. She whispered into my ear before releasing her arms from around my neck. A shiver went through my body as I speechlessly stood up and looked down at her. She flashed me a big grin and then turned away. Bye, she called from over her shoulder as she skipped towards my uncle and Marie. I couldn't get in my car fast enough and left without so much as even a wave. The drive back to San Francisco to meet my parents had given me time to process all the events of the past weeks and left me with some very unsettling thoughts. Marie's first husband had died from a fall down the stairs. His death had been ruled accidental, but I'm not so sure I believe that now. 
I tried talking to my parents about everything, but they thought I was over-exaggerating and chalked it up to my overactive imagination brought on by boredom. That was until, about a month later, when I came home to find my mum in tears by the phone. What happened? Is it Dad? Is he okay? I asked, racing to Mum's side. <laughs> your father's fine, sobbed Mum. It's your Uncle Henry. He's dead. She paused to blow her nose. He fell down the stairs and broke his neck. It instantly severed his spinal cord. Some people like to spend Valentine's Day with their significant other over a steak dinner and wine lit up by soft candlelight. But I am no romantic. I make it a point to get shit-faced on someone else's dime, get laid, and afterward enjoy the candy by myself. I'm sure that such a playboy attitude is considered ugly in a woman, but that doesn't stop Jeb, what's his name, from answering me on Blender. He meets me outside a bar, and I knock back a few martinis listening to him make comments about the other bar goers. He doesn't waste much time talking about himself. If he does, I tune it out and forget. I only start to care when he takes me by the waist and pulls us outside. I only care when he goes silent, leading me up the stairs into his dim apartment. I tune back in when his fingers tangle up in my hair, and he pulls a scalp a little too roughly. I smile against his lips as he feels me up, stumbling backward toward his bed. I only feel alive when I get him inside me, and sense that beating heart beneath my fingers. I like getting it on in the dark. They can't see when I start sprouting an octa set of extra legs. Sometimes I manage to actually nab a guy that isn't useful to society. This isn't one of those times. Two hairy black pedipulps pierce the stomach of, from what I can figure, is a decent guy. I think he mentioned being a doctor, or a nurse, some career with definitely a higher morality than I can appreciate. Because I'm not the type of person who's going to hem and haw about whether I go to the store, and my chocolate bar is broken in the middle. I don't care if I'm stealing the last one in supply, straight from a kid's hand. I'm going to use my mandibles to rip open the package. And God help whoever gets in my way. I don't care anything about the outer presentation. Or the finer ingredients that make up Jeb, what's his name. I'm only here for the warm and gooey surprise center. And I find that if I do this every night and wrap up what's left over. I don't have to wait once a year to receive those delectable, little candied hearts. When the champagne arrives, I know exactly what to expect. He's been dropping hints all evening, all week even, talking about our date non-stop disappearing for hours with the vague excuse of shopping. And wow, isn't it great how his friend Mike is getting married soon? Oof. He made us watch the proposal last night for crying out loud. Nick's got marriage on the brain. And I know he's enough of a romantic to wait until Valentine's Day to pop the question. The waiter sidles up to our table, 
just before dessert. Two flutes of champagne balanced on a tray. Nick takes them both from him, setting his down first and pausing before passing me mine. I tactfully look away as Nick slips something from his palm into one of the glasses. But I can hear the soft splash and plink of it dropping in and hitting the bottom. When he hands me the glass, I position my fingers around it so I can't see the ring. If he's trying to be subtle about it, <laughs> I'll play along. Besides, this is an important moment. I don't want my first look at my new engagement ring to be some kind of accidental sideways glance. To us, Nick says, raising his glass. I smile, clinking our glasses together. To us. Then I follow his lead and take a sip of champagne. There's a, a funny tang to the liquid as it hits my tongue. But it's bound to taste a little strange with a ring in it. You never know what chemicals they put on those things to make them sparkle. Nick's watching me carefully. His own drink already back on the table. So I know he's waiting for me to notice. I tip the glass a little further back. But pause as something bumps against my lip. The small smile on Nick's face turns into a full-blown grin. This is the moment. I fake my surprise, shooting him a questioning glance before pulling the glass away and taking a look at it. The first thing I notice is the color. His champagne is normal, that beautiful light amber color. Mine's more pink verging on red. The second thing I notice is the severed finger resting in my glass. It's sticking straight up, the tip just reaching the surface of the champagne. It's still wearing a diamond ring that taps against the sides of the glass as my hand shakes. Katie, Nick breathes reaching across the table to take my hand in his. Will you marry me? When I committed suicide, I died, but I didn't. I don't know how she does it. I feel the cold, unforgiving metal against my temple. I feel my quivering finger against the trigger. I hear a click, then a roar, then something rushing through my head, and then nothing. But then I hear her voice, and the bullet comes out of my head, and the wound closes, and the gun is out of my hand, and I'm standing in front of her. We met at a work party. She snuck whiskey into a flask and was taking swigs of it all through the night. She ended up drinking too much and I had to take her home. One thing led to another and we got married two years later. She changed so slowly I didn't even realize it had happened. I'd come home during the first few weeks of our marriage to find her in her room. I'd come home during the first few weeks of our marriage to find her in our room, working. She'd look up at me and smile, ask me how my day went. But after a year, she was cold, aloof. She criticized everything I did, claiming I no longer cared for her. She attacked our children with vile words and painful blows. But. I can't give up on us. It's my fault she changed, she says, and she's right. I only considered suicide because it became apparent 
that I was not good enough for her. She deserved nothing but the best, and I was not the best. I needed to go. I tried cutting my wrists, hanging myself from the ceiling fan, overdosing on tablets. Everything I tried succeeded, but I always find myself alive. I like to think that my love for her is too strong. It won't let me give up on us. If we weren't meant to be together, we would have broken up long ago. Oh, I love her. Even though she storms and screams and hits and hurts, I love her. Even though our children merely survive, not live, because of her, I'd do anything for her. Good night. Sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Wake up bright in the morning light to do what's right with all your might. Remember, this is just a story. But whatever you do, don't let those bed bugs bite tonight. Now, my dear friends, it's time to sit back and relax in whatever way you wish. And please join me and listen. Mm. Watching. I have something I must confess. I've been watching you. <laughs> yes. Right this second. Unaware of my proximity, I've been watching you for the past several days. You have such a lovely home, full of space and dark corners. I like the dark. All that time, I've been in your home, just watching you. Well, not just watching, but we'll come to that later. I watch you perform your nightly routines before slipping into your bed under your warm blanket. I watch you until you fall asleep. I'm there to see you awaken in the morning to daybreak's new light. I am so still. My stare remains unbroken and undisturbed for hours and hours. You are so beautiful when you sleep. I wish you could see yourself as I see you. Your body is a sensual furnace of heat that radiates endless plumes of vibrant red, orange and yellow flames as you slumber. I bask in your warmth and light. Your rhythmic rising and falling of your chest is the source of a breath that can ignite the very air around you. Announcing to the universe that you are here and you are alive. The beauty of the spectacle can hold me in a trance the entire night until the morning light forces me to retreat to my dark haven. Other nights, I come to you. You don't even feel my touch. Up and down your arms and thighs. I touch you with the utmost care. I would never want to disturb you while you sleep. 
Your skin is so soft and delicate. So unlike mine. Your body is a landscape of ecstasy, with a new wonder just waiting to be discovered and explored. Your aroma is intoxicating and invokes an insatiable hunger that I surrender to and gorge upon. I then, quietly, make my way back to my hiding place. I am hidden well before the first rays of morning peek through the windows. I am so quiet. You never realize I was there. You awake and go about your life as you would any other day, while I sleep, content, but still filled with anticipation for what the following night will hold for us. I see that you have noticed the marks I left behind. Marks on your thighs and arms and throughout your body. I know they hurt. And I am truly sorry for that. But things like that are unavoidable when it comes to matters such as these. I am always so careful that my kisses are soft and delicate. I kiss your body ever so lightly and cautiously. I would not dare spill a single drop of your blood. It saddens me that soon I will have to share you with others. However, I know that you will be just as beautiful to them as you are to me. I know their touch will be equally as delicate as my touches have been. I know their kisses will show as much tenderness as mine have always had. My eggs will hatch any day now. The little ones will most likely hide within the mattress and frame of your bed, a trait for which we earned our names. I much prefer the nightstand next to your bed. The tiny crevice on its side allows me to look upon your face for as long as I desire. It is from here that I simply gaze and wait for our next encounter. Uh, interesting little collection there, wasn't it? Okay, well, that's all from me this evening. Hope you've had a nice Valentine's Day. I will be back with you, of course, on Friday. Until then, bye-bye.